Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this FPNA Trends webinar, where today we'll be talking about leveraging predictive planning and forecasting within XPNA. My name is Hans Gobin, and I will be your facilitator today. Of course, I am with FPNA Trends and International FPNA Board. Uh, just so you know, as statistics, we've got over 550 people joining us from 65 countries. We have three panelists joining us with fantastic uh, insight for you guys. So looking forward to this meeting. Hope you enjoy it as well. Um, so what do we have for you on the agenda? So we'll look at predictive planning and forecasting maturity model, uh, some definitions and everything else to start with. We'll look at predictive analytics example use cases in finance and in business. Um, we'll look at a case study uh, from Novartis. We will then go and look at how uh, AI, et cetera, is applied for uh, practically. Um, we'll do some conclusions and recommendation, and then we will do our exciting Q&A session right at the end of this. Um, so it's a good time for me now to introduce to you my panelists. So panelists, if you can turn your webcam on and come um, off mute as well. And we can start by introducing um, Sebastian. Uh, so first panelist today will be Sebastian Poda, who is head of FPNA at Royal Schiphol Group, based in uh, Netherlands, uh, Amsterdam in Netherlands. And of course, he will take us through some practical examples in finance and business of predictive analytics. Sebastian, great to have you with us. Hello, Hans. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to everybody joining. Happy to be here and looking forward to the session. Brilliant. Thank you, Sebastian. Same here. Our second uh, panelist today is Christine Fromont, neuroscience CFO at Novartis, based in sunny Geneva today um, in Switzerland. And she will take us through her case study as to how they implemented uh, predictive analytics within Novartis and all the benefits and, and you know, focus areas uh, and learnings. So, Christine, great to have you with us. Looking forward to um, the insight. Thank you very much, and uh, looking forward to this fruitful discussion. Brilliant. Thank you. And then finally, we have Michael Conley, who is with uh, Walter Kluwers. Uh, he's joining us all the way from uh, Arizona in the United States. And he will take us through practical application of AI for integrated planning. So, Michael, thank you very much for being with us today. Good morning. Yes, it's early for me. So uh, I know this is at the end of some of your day. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. I think we're going to have a good discussion. Thanks, Hans. Absolutely. It's, it's six odd o'clock uh, in the morning for Michael. So, <laughs> Michael, thank you for joining us. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've got uh, three exciting panelists. Lots of great insight and uh, use case studies as well coming your way. Uh, I've got some housekeeping, so I'll ask the panelists to switch their webcam off and go on mute, whilst I'll take um, everybody else through some housekeeping. So thank you. Um, let me start by thanking our technology partner today, who's uh, Volta Kluwers, um, CCH Togetic. We all know they've got an award-winning expert solution. So thank you for uh, being our technology partner today. Um, of course, uh, a quick one um, on FPNA Trends Group. We are now in 29 cities, 16 countries, four continents, having added Austin and Miami since you know we kind of started meeting uh, face to face. So look out for some more new chapters coming very very soon. Uh, let's not forget our digital community where we do um, a lot of stuff. You know, FPNA Trends um, Digest the webinars and everything else. And finally, FPNA education, research and consulting, where we've got um, a lot of committees, surveys, research, white paper as well. So please look out for it um, as well and um, take some time to uh, get to know them. Um, so for those who haven't joined us before, let me tell you it's a, a one hour webinar. Uh, your participation is very much required. So we've got two exciting polling questions. We know what the panelists are doing, but what are you doing within your organization as far as predictive planning um, and analysis is concerned? So please vote. 
Uh, you can ask questions via the chat box right now or after each presentation, but make sure you tell us who you want to answer those questions. We've got time for some questions today. The rest we will answer to you directly via email. So all questions will get answered. The presentation is available in handouts for you to download right now, or if not, you will get a copy uh, as well as a link to the recording after the meeting. And then finally, when I close the session, please give us 30 seconds. We've got a survey. Uh, tell us how we did, uh, but also tell us what topic would you like um, us to bring you next time as well. So please um, give us your participation in the next hour. Um, quickly, I've got a few slides that I would like to uh, set the scene with, introduce. Um, and this is a great one from our FPNA trend survey. Um, and here you can see, you know, if you look at the desire, the, the current um, uh, bar chart is how much time we are spending as FPNA, as finance, doing what sort of activities. So 45% of time is spent on low value activities. And that is data collection, data validation. Um, and only 33% is spent on driving action and insight generation. I mean, I will go one step further and say that 67 versus 33, but we want that 33 to be 55 at least. So what I'm trying to get to is that we are still spending a lot of time doing low value activities, but how can we change that? Uh, before we go a little bit deeper, this is something for you to read in your own time. It's around uh, definition of AI, ML, um, predictive analytics, just to make sure there's not much confusion around what are we talking here. But of course, we are talking about predictive um, planning or analytics. And what is it? It's use of data, statistical algorithms, and machine learning techniques to identify the likelihood of future outcomes on historical data. So we're mining the data, looking at um, the historical um, outcomes, and then how can we predict the future using that? And how can we use those prediction in planning for future? So please do read this in your own time. So we are at the moment writing a paper on predictive planning and forecasting. And to give you a taster, it's going to be ready uh, end of May but this is the maturity model that's going to fall out of it. So it is a taster, look out for it. But what I wanted to highlight here is that what are those leading state organization doing in the predictive planning and forecasting? In terms of data, in terms of drivers, what sort of model do they use? What sort of processes do they use? What sort of skill set is required? And then finally, in terms of technology, what technology they are using? I don't plan to go into this into too much detail because our panelists will be covering a lot of these. So without further ado, I would like to reintroduce to you now uh, Sebastian uh, Podak, who is head of FPNA at Raj Shipol Group, who will take us through his practical examples. So over to you, Sebastian, whenever you're ready. Perfect. Thank you very much, Hans. Uh... Uh, for introduction um what i would like to share today with uh, with all of you is uh really some experiences um uh, some hopefully interesting use cases and uh, key learnings that i've uh basically learned and developed over several years journey by far uh, although i do represent uh let's say in my current role uh, a royal Schiphol group uh, what I'd like to share with you shall not be associated just with this company. It's just actually an aggregation of some experiences uh, throughout the years. So moving on uh, to the next slide. Uh, first and foremost, um, you know, the, the reason for uh, me to start uh, experiencing predictive analytics was really to bring uh, finance and FP&A to the next level in uh, decision-making process. So it was really a theme for us to, to move towards a value adding uh, function uh, uh, in, a, in a business uh, steering and performance management. And here I listed, you know, several use cases that uh, I found particularly 
uh, helpful or, or, or where predictive analytics could really prove uh, its value. As you can see, there is a couple of examples from finance or more business oriented areas, uh, if I may say so, ranging from revenue forecasting to, 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 to market size forecasting. You see a lot about you know, uh, cash management and optimization, but also even compliance topics uh, uh, such as a, a, a certain fraud prevention or quality of your processes uh, assessment. Um, you, you know, for the sake of time, if I could maybe dive into two selected ones to give a bit more flavor. For example, the short-term revenue forecasting uh, three months forward, which is the first topic, that was uh, in a business where the need was to really increase the quality of forecasting accuracy. And the reason for that was to make sure that uh, uh, along with the accurate revenue forecast, we can optimize our asset base and mobilize our operational resources in a most efficient way. Um, so it's a very concrete need and, uh, and a very concrete uh, interest from a business. And, and, and basically, you know, for adopting predictive analytics and running through a, a you know, process from uh, starting from uh, hundreds of drivers, uh, getting into the model, training the model, in the end, uh, 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 getting a solution which ultimately, based on, uh, uh, let's say, five to seven uh, drivers uh, uh, respected by the business, uh, we could achieve a forecasting accuracy that was constantly overbeating, you know, every business forecast that was happening in the past. So uh, a, a fantastic example of where you could leverage predictive analytics uh, uh, um, uh, in your own organizations. Um, touching upon another one, I actually both the operating working capital optimization as well as fraud prevention, it was more like a Christopher Columbus approach. There was no specific you know, interest except of testing the quality of the processes or finding out how can you manage your cash better. And that's typically an approach where you actually take dump of your data from your either ERP system, uh, uh, from general ledger, and you let actually machine learning algorithms or, or AI to find certain patterns in data or certain anomalies in there that really can you can find very insightful in driving quality of your processes uh, uh, or uh, actually certain insights that can help you to steer working capital efficiency. Um, for the sake of time, maybe I will stop on these two, but I hope you will find at least the scope and, uh, and the different uh, examples uh, uh, quite inspiring and interesting to think very broad about where it can be adopted. Uh, what was helpful for us in the journey uh, uh, was a certain framework that is depicted here. So obviously, when we talk about advanced analytics, uh, you know, the first things that comes to people's mind is, is, is data science. Uh, and, and But data science is it, just a domain where, where you need to probably think about a couple of critical components ranging from, uh, let's say, data. How can you, uh, without data, there is no data science. Obviously, there is a certain uh, uh, um, education required or capability skill set that you can apply certain mathematical methods to, to, uh, uh, to work with the data, uh, ideally supported with certain tooling. And of course, behind all of these are people or people capabilities. But, but, but even if you organize all these, uh, what's critical is that you should look at it as kind of a process where in the end you try to we try to approach always certain business challenge, apply data to it and try to bring it successfully to the business. And this framework repeated time over time on multiple cases led us to the couple of interesting learnings which I find quite insightful that 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 uh, uh, shaped the journey forward. So moving to the next slide, um, you know, if I would take the uh, data science component, you know, when we started with predictive analytics, typically, you know, first you need to get your data, uh, and that is that's a very labor intense gathering exercise with cleansing the data, make them, uh, you know, of the proper quality. Uh, uh, this is where you start. But over time, uh, once you enter into more and more cases, you quickly discover the importance of that aspect, and then the theme that is really uh, helping to address that, you look strategically into data and you really try to develop the whole strategy, how you how you gather the data, internal and external, you know, structured, unstructured, uh, uh, what have you. 
Uh, the other aspect is, of course, people. Well, there is no data science with the proper capabilities. So I must say that finding the people at the beginning was not an easy task. I do see on the market that competition for the talent is increasing, but also at the same time, I think supply of the talent with the many universities offering education in this area makes it really, really scalable uh, uh, these days. Uh, and in the end, even supported with a modern tooling that is in place, uh, which uh, um, basically will have a chance to learn something more uh, later in this webinar as well, uh, can really help to scale it up. Uh, what I we found, uh, especially maybe another angle to it, interesting on the virtue with the business, is that um, when you begin with that uh, um, with that framework, uh, and what we see on the next slide, that the first learning is that you need to find your first use cases and actually trying to build trust with the business and you know search for some inspiration to experiment with it. Uh, but actually, once you you know, uh, pick your first battles right and, and, and you will really be satisfied or find, a, a, you know, a great results out of that. Um, you know, the, the, the appetite for this type of activities uh, is increasing exponentially. Uh, and actually, in many organizations that I used to, uh, let's say, uh, you know, experiment with predictive analytics, we've been moving really to, to a situation where we're thinking like how to best actually use that capability to support uh, decision making, be it in a you know planning process or being in solving a certain uh, uh, business challenge, and and uh, and actually the last one but not least, uh, you know where it all starts is like uh, uh, once you find first cases right and and you, and you will have uh, uh, some maturity and learning in it. Uh, actually, uh, I've seen that there is more and more appetite to start really considering predictive analytics and data as a strategic aspect and objective for realizing goals of the company. So uh, th that shows actually, you know, that uh, predictive analytics really can help you, your teams, your function move to a really much more value-adding territory uh, in steering the, the business decision-making or uh, uh, business planning process. Well, I think we come to uh, to last of my slides, so I would be happy to take any Q&A later on or listen to your experiences as well. Let me hand over to Hans. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Fantastic presentation here where we looked at uh, the, the six different examples. Of course, we couldn't go through all of them in detail. And then we looked at the framework and then all the challenges and, and how beneficial use of predictive analytics is uh, within organizations. Um, I think uh, now we've seen what you are doing and or what you've done, it's a good time for us to go out and ask our audience, um, what are they doing as far as predictive um, analytics is concerned? So if you can vote, please, what, how would you describe your current state of predictive analytics or PA deployment for FPNA? We already use it. We plan to deploy in the next six months. We plan to deploy in the next couple of years. So we're kind of thinking about it, but we're not firm to anything. Or finally, we do not have any plans for using any predictive anal analytics at all. So if you can vote, please. So first answer is we use it already, fine. Second answer, we plan to deploy in six months. Third, in the next couple of years. And finally, um, we do not have any plans at all for deployment. Uh, I'll give it another few seconds and I'm now going to close it and share it with uh, uh, everybody here. So 13% are already using it, which is fantastic. 15% plan to deploy in the next six months, 37 in the next uh, two years, and then finally 35 have got no plans whatsoever. Uh, Sebastian, any insight from you on the uh, outcome here? Thank you, Hans, and thank you, of course, uh, uh, for your votes. Uh, I think I have uh, possibly maybe two observations uh, uh, that come to my mind. I'm actually uh, interesting to observe from my perspective where we started the journey a few years back that I see more and more actually organizations apparently uh, already experimenting with predictive analytics. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm strong proponent of this, so I'm curious about your experiences with it. 
Um, at the same time, what I find interesting that eventually in some businesses uh, or uh, environments, it might not be seen as a, as a way to go, which is also actually uh, quite uh, possibly striking from this uh, poll question uh, uh, to me. Uh, uh, interesting yeah. to learn more about that, certainly. Yeah, no, no, great, great sort of points. But if you look at it, 28% are already going to use it within the next six months with an additional 37%. So lots and lots of people are already thinking of implementing it. But let's not forget, there's a 35%. So hopefully we can convince those people um, to go on and use it in, in the future um, and take it back to the organization. So panelists, please do join me. Let us uh, look at the mini discussion question that we have here from Sebastian uh, itself. And what Sebastian wants to uh, probe into is what are the key skill sets needed for predictive forecasting or planning implementation? Christine, can I come to you with the first uh, set of answer, please? Yeah, um, well, definitely for me is, is um, change management and the willingness to try something new. So that's definitely a, an important skill set that is needed. Um, so you often see people that don't have the right culture or mindset to go through those changes. I mean, uncertainty is, is frightening for a lot of people and the unknown is usually what we're fear of. So definitely to, to be open and be transparent and say, we might not get it right the first time, but it's a first good step in the right direction. So agile, agility um, during this type of implementation is key for me. Absolutely spot on. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael? Yeah, you know, the other thing that strikes me is that some of the skill sets that Sebastian talked about, you know, are quite technical. Uh, and being able to work with large volumes of data and being able to find those key nuggets of information within that data and then apply that to your business and model your business based on that is is really difficult to do uh, you know with with a human mind you can only move so fast so you know I think technology can facilitate a lot of that and do some of that heavy lifting in terms of sorting through massive amounts of data in terms of easily finding trends and those kinds of things so you know I'd like to think that over time, uh, we can really focus people on the results of what that shows and not on the how to get there and the, you know, the sifting through all of the data in order to find the insights. So, you know, I think that th hopefully this will evolve over time to not require such a heavy, intense amount of uh, kind of analytical capacity in the in terms of the folks that are working on it. Great, great answer there. Thank you very much. And, and finally, Sebastian, anything you want to add before we close this session? If, if I may, shortly, I, I, I mean, fantastic inputs. I, um, I I truly believe that without, you know, being uh, uh, open for change, well, it's, of course, very difficult to uh, to embark on the journey. Um, so spot on, I think, remark, Christina. And uh, I recognize that what Michael said, you know, the certain technical skills that is required. Otherwise, of course, you cannot offer the service that uh, that, that possibly uh, uh, you would like to uh, experience M maybe one one addition what what also maybe at the end of the process what i found also actually quite interesting is how do you best then utilize the hopefully great outcomes of the of, of, of predictive analytics and how you marry that in a business related process because in the end typically you also basically do it to to influence certain certain planning or decision and and that is there we talk far less about technical uh, you know skill set it's much more about influencing and kind of storytelling and bringing that to life so that's possibly something what what, what completes possibly the, the overall yeah. picture in my mind absolutely spot on thank you very much for that yeah. guys in in the essence of time let us move on to our next session now so if we can uh, um quickly here introduce christine again uh, neuroscience cfo at novartis uh, and today, Christine will take us through her own case study. Uh, Christine, over to you whenever you're ready. Thank you, Hans. Um, hi, everybody. Happy to um, walk you through the case study at Novartis. So for those who don't know, Novartis is a big pharma organization, over 100,000 employees worldwide, and it's structured mainly in silos. So you have the commercial side, the research and development side, the production side, um, etc. And my case study is really just on the commercial side of it. 
Um, I would like to start this presentation with a quote that was inspirational to us during the implementation process uh, from Richard Branson. Whatever your goal is, you will never succeed unless you let go of your fears and fly. We use that slide at the beginning of most of our um, presentation um, and working session throughout the implementation because you do have to let go of your fears and just dive in. Um, that was definitely really important for us. So moving to the next slide, we've started, Navartis started the transformation journey in 2021. Um, and one of the key pillars of that transformation journey was to look at um, predictive planning. So as many big organizations, the budget process, or what we call target financial plan process, was lengthy, tedious, iterative, uh, not necessarily efficient, spanning from May to December and sometimes even leaking into the January. Um, so we looked at this and tried to see what, how can we improve this and we came up with um, a bold plan of one financial plan or what we call internally one FP. The idea was to um, do this in a six week process. So from nine months to six weeks, it is very ambitious, uh, centrally driven plan and really based on AI, machine learning, um, and a little bit of human intelligence, definitely, to make sure that the, we look at the number properly and we challenge a little bit of our assumption. So delivering on our financial commitments while focusing on the execution was definitely key. Uh, letting go of some of the detail, focusing on the main brand, main countries was another big element. Um, and how we approach um, the predictive planning when we looked at the PNL, we said, well, we could definitely use AI for the top line. Um, AI can help us predict the number of patients, the percentage of market share we can gain, um, price evolution as well with the what everything is going on in the healthcare system. Um, for us, the cost of good comes directly from the operations or, or take-ups side of the business. So there's nothing that we can do with this. We just plug a price per unit and you have your gross margin and we wanted to push it a little bit further so we also looked at marketing um, and we use ai to try to see what was the best mix of marketing and we looked at different models but for us the best um, we came to the conclusion using marketing in percentage of sales um, depending of brand a b and c and country a b and c uh, it an, in a bell curve before launch, launch and after launch, what is the optimal amount of marketing we should spend doing those launch and, and promoting the, the, the brands. Um, that bulk amount was pushed to the country and it was to the countries to operationalize it and decide the proper marketing mix they would use, which varies quite a lot by countries. Um, and they know what works, what doesn't. So we let really the detail to the country, but we gave them a number that they couldn't derail um, from. So moving to the next slide, when we've done this, as it was a massive transformation for the organization, we try to think what can be the, the concern, the question, what we need to pay attention, the key um, focus areas. And we came with three main areas that we need to focus on. The fundamental process change was one. The mindset change was a second one. And the increased automation and support, not just in generating the data, but also in, in producing the slides and the entire process of looking at the financial performance of the organization. So in the fundamental process change, the main thing that really was important for us and we thought we couldn't succeed without was a high support from top management. That has to be supported. The organization from the top to the bottom need to push for this change to happen because it's not gonna be perfect. There's gonna be some mistake. There's gonna be some frustration. And if you don't support it by the top, um, then you're not in a safe environment and, and you have fears of retaliation and things like that. So we made sure that we had support from top management to do this. Um, in the mindset change, the most important for us, which was a big issue, and I know it's the same for a lot of other organizations where I work for, in a lot of organization, bonus or salary or incentive, I don't know how you call this, but is coupled with meeting target objective. Um, and if you keep this, but they don't have a say on the target that they're receiving, then you start an internal war in politics that won't go 
um, it will, will lead you nowhere. So we work with HR to make sure that we were coming up with a different set of incentive and guidance to decouple the remuneration process with the target setting. So they did not have much say in the number, but it did not have any impact on their paycheck that they were bringing home. So that was really important. Um, and then increased automation. Obviously, we worked a lot on improving AI and machine learning maturity um, alongside with the human intelligence. And we built a whole set of digital tools helping presenting from the system directly a budget presentation with graphs and slides without going through the slides production. Um, moving to the next slide. With all of this, there was a lot of learning, definitely. Um, I would say one of the best learning that, I mean, something that resonated to me and was really key to our success um, was really building trust in, in machine learning and AI. At the beginning, the idea and the instruction was don't do any bottom up, trust us, we're going to give you a number. And after a few weeks, I start to sense it wasn't going to work. A lot of people didn't understand you have a number coming out of a black box. What's that number? What is it doing for me? Um, so I did let uh, in neuroscience, a lot of the countries do a bottom up and challenge our AI. Um, and when there was big discrepancy, we worked with them to try to understand where it was coming and use these either to uh, improve their model, human model, or improve a little bit the AI model. Um, so that was really important. The other thing that was really good, I was holding weekly calls with countries and, and regions to discuss the plan and where we are and what we were facing, being honest and, and transparent, be vulnerable. From the get-go, I said, it won't be perfect. It won't work as marvels. We are going to face some issues. There's going to be some problems. But failure is not an option. We're already in September when we launched this. So going back to the nine months process is not an option. So we have to go through this together. But by acknowledging the mistakes and saying it won't be perfect, people feel relieved that, of that pressure of making everything. And, and they trust our honesty and, and transparency. And it helped us quite a lot to achieve. Um, at the end, we didn't manage in six weeks. We managed in nine, which was a very good um, implementation and the second year so for the 2023 budget we managed in six weeks which was very good so um, that's all of my learnings and I hope uh, it's enlightening for you guys so Hans over to you Christine thank you very much fantastic presentation uh, I, I mean very ambitious to start from nine months to go to nine uh, to six week but of course, achieving uh, nine weeks for the whole one financial plan is just amazing. And it, it, here it shows you the power of predictive planning uh, and analytics if you adopt it. So fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing that. But let us now ask our audience um, on our uh, second polling question, especially on the blockers. Uh, and I've just launched the second poll here. So what is the biggest roadblock for starting predictive analytics and machine learning based forecasting in your company? Uh, of course, the first answer is we already use it, so there's there's nothing major to talk about there. Uh, the second one is uh, talent gap. A uh, third one is lack of clean and structured data. So data, um, uh, we looked at company culture, which is the fourth one, and finally, uh, technology. What would you say is the biggest blocker in your uh, predictive analytics journey? Is it a, um, a, you already do it. B is the talent gap. C, it's data. D, technology. Sorry, culture. And finally, we've got uh, technology. I'll give it another few seconds for you to vote. Um, and I'm now going to close the voting. So thank you very much for voting. And I will share this. And we can see, of course, 2% is already using, so no problem. 13% say talent. 46% uh, lack of data, 25 company culture, and 14% technology. So um, if I move on and ask um, uh, Christine to give us some comments on this. Christine, please. Uh, yes, uh, and I'm not really surprised uh, by the results. Um, having clean and structured data is, is something that most organizations underestimate at the beginning. Um, data governance and clean data lake to start a predictive planning and, and AI 
is definitely the first stepping stone to do this. So I'm not really surprised. I'm surprised that only 2% is already predictive in ML based forecasting. But um, the rest is, yeah, company culture would come second because I think you need the proper mindset in the entire organization. Like I said, um, you need vulnerability, you need agile thinking, you need to accept failure um, because it's not going to go without problem the first time you launch this. Definitely yeah. not. Absolutely. Great points there, Christine. So thank you very much for that. Let me uh, uh, hide this now and, and let us go and look at uh, our question to the other panelists from yourself. So panelists, if you'd like to join us, and the question is all about how do you build trust in the tool? So if I can uh, go to Sebastian first. Sebastian, what will your answer be? Mm, thank you, Hans. Uh, actually, it's a good question. Uh, and. Uh, I'm thinking like maybe to answer not so much by the tool, but but maybe more predictive forecasting or machine learning overall. Uh, what, what I found particularly, let's say, uh, helpful at the beginning, if that concept is applied in a in a let's say certain business uh, uh, understandable challenge and it's explained to some business drivers that are let's say uh, uh, well. Uh, embraced by the business. That helps a lot to get a buy-in and actually you immediately feel the support. Um, obviously, along the way, uh, I think uh, there is nothing better what I found as building on your own success and every, you know, proven case just just a zone and, and builds trust on its own. Uh, so, so, so I maybe don't narrow it to the tool, but maybe more to the whole concept uh, Thank uh, just to Thank share. You, Sebastian. Really, really insightful. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Uh, can we go to Michael? Michael, your answer, please. Yeah, you know, I think it's uh, it's human nature to not necessarily be trustful of new technology, and particularly when it's a topic that's somewhat sensitive around artificial intelligence, machine learning. You know, the the whole uh, machines are taking over the world kind of you know drama that comes with that. So hopefully over time, people will become more comfortable with the technology. They'll realize that the ream of data that is needed to go through to find these trends is just simply not doable from the human perspective. It just takes too much time. And so that's where these technologies really can speed the process and get you to the answer faster. Uh, but I think that people will go through the challenges that Christine just talked about in terms of trusting that technology until it's been proven a few times in their environment. And then uh, hopefully people will be able to make that leap. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and of course, Christine, you, you've summed it up very well in your presentation as to how you went about uh, building the trust. So panelists, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, just before we move to the next session, I'd just like to remind the audience, please keep sending your questions. We will answer a few um, uh, today. Those we can't answer, we will answer to you via email. So please keep doing that. Thank you very much. Uh, and we now move to our second, uh, sorry, third session, which is from Michael. And Michael will take us through practical application of AI for integrated planning. So, Michael, ready when you are? Great. Thank you, Hans. We can get right into it. So, you know, when we talk about leveraging technology to build trust, that's really, you know, what I'm here to talk to you about. I want to show you what's capable with the current technology. And then I think you have to decide, you know, how much of this can you incorporate? Um, do you need to walk before you run? Uh, are you ready for technology? So you've probably all heard these buzzwords, artificial intelligence, of course, machine learning, of course, but now this predictive analytics, this prescriptive analytics, um, robotics, natural processing language, Python, these are all words that you hear. It may be a little intimidating if you're not familiar with all of these things, um, but I, I'm gonna try and boil that down to you. So if we can go to the next slide, you know, I would say AI is anything but artificial. It's real and it's happening now. Um, and what finance leaders are saying, we did a study uh, about a year ago, and 83% of uh, the finance leaders that we polled said that they the really struggle with being ready for disruption from any direction, and then also to be you know, more looking forward. So it's kind of a struggle to know how do I, how much time do I spend on looking forward and how much time do I make sure that we're resilient within our operations? 75% of those people said that they struggle with being proactive, being innovative, um, because they're so often caught up in being responsive to things that are happening. 
uh, around them within the finance organization. And then I think similar to what we've seen in the polls here, 42% of them said they're using AI and 43% they're using said that they are considering using AI, which I think lines up nicely with the poll we saw here. Um, what's interesting there is I wonder what the other 15% are doing. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next page. Um, so the biggest struggle here is adoption. And you know, that's what we just talked about here after Christine's uh, discussion. And you know, it's kind of does big data enable AI or does AI enable big data? And so you can kind of answer that either way. Is it the chicken or is it the egg? And you know, the idea is finding the right solution that fits for you. Um, a lot of solutions in the marketplace really are just statistical calculations, right? So they're not very advanced. Um, but the more robust uh, scenarios and, and technologies that are available are able to internal are, are able to internally leverage real neural networks and deep learning and those kinds of things without the need to rely on underlying cloud platform like Azure. Uh, or AWS. And so this provides your model with explainability and we think that that's really integral and important in the in the uh, technology process around predictive planning. So let's go to the next slide. You know, this is just a, a you know to try and simplify this, you know, what are the things that you can go and do? And you can go and do these things without technology, right? So, you know, if you have the ability to use uh, machine learning or AI, which I think both of the previous presenters talked about the fact that they leveraged this, right? It, it really is a requirement when you've got lots and lots of data that you want to analyze. Uh, so you use that machine learning or that AI to uh, bring the historical data and create accurate models. And then you take the current data, you put it into those models, and you see what that projection comes out like. What you're looking for are business drivers. And the business drivers really explain and empower people to explain why is it coming up with the answer that it's coming up with, right? It's looking for those trends and those patterns. And then making informed decisions because now I've got better information. It takes some of the guesswork out. Um, I can be more confident when I'm making that, um, that proposal or that presentation around what we should do within the, the predictive planning space. Um, and then, you know, the, the models are learning, right? So it, it, it's intended for the models to get smarter and smarter. So as you are training new models, as you're adding new uh, data inputs, um, you're clarifying any ambiguity that's in that model. And using the technology, again, can help you go through many, many data sources to find the ones that are really true nuggets in your organization. Um, and so, you know, the whole idea here is having all access to all of these models. And so let's go to the next slide. You know, it, it, what we what we like to see here is an open library of statistical modeling, right? So um, we, this is where we want to move people away from needing to learn this and be a statistician uh, and be, you know, be uh, very, very involved in how that data is called and, and gone through. Um, using technology, we can use a standard set of models. We can find the right model that is closely aligned to our data, and then we can use that to do our insights. So um, in our technology, we have a, a resident of solutions. There's 38 solutions that are already embedded. So you don't need to go and research. You don't need to go and build a fancy Excel spreadsheet or a pivot table. You can do this with existing technology if that's available within the platform that you choose. And you can also easily import outside models. So you can bring in Python algorithms. Uh, and in an open architecture, you should be able to extend the data that you've got into a platform that you can add to your solution. So if we go to the next uh, slide, this just kind of shows what those various things are and, and how we approach that training. So in an optimal solution, you use multiple models and you're basically testing the predictions. So you're running the same data through multiple models and looking for the closest fit. Um, and then you do cross-validation across all of them and you score them. And what you're looking for here is the data set and the model that score the highest, that are the most correlated, because those are things then that you can easily use to pre be predictive in the future state of what your financial situation is gonna look like. So, you know, we divide the data set into two parts. There's a training set, there's a validation set. We go through uh, iterations of this, as I just showed on the other slide. And every time that a validation set is used to test the model, we compute the metric of error, whether that's a positive metric, you know, in terms of performance, or whether it's a uh, negative metric like error within your forecast. And so in the end, whichever one of those has the best score, 
based on the type of um, uh, statistic that you're looking for in measurement, um, then you know, that's the one that you want to use. And the aim of the whole process is not to overtrain the model, but to find the right fit for the model within your particular environment. And so with that, uh, we're going to do a uh, review of this solution. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to see it. I'm gonna go off camera to make this a little bit larger, uh, but I'd like to show you a sample of how this workflow can work and how these solutions can be leveraged. And at the very end of this demonstration, you'll actually see that the user still can have interaction with what the model has created in terms of that statistical best model fit um, where they know something that the model can't know, doesn't know, that's forward looking, that's not in the history that the model was, was using to do the calculations. And so you'll see how the user can still make modifications to the, to the machine learning's results. So I'm gonna go off camera and this will be uh, about four minutes. It all starts good, clean, historical data. As covered in data integration section, we're able to bring data in from virtually any data source out there and massage and normalize it on the way in. Anomaly detection algorithms like isolation forest, local outliers factor, and Malinobis distance, to name a few, are widely used to help with this task. As you can see in this example, we're not only bringing in historical financial data, but are also supplementing it with operational data from supply chain, demographics data, market data, as well as other external data. The more data we can bring in, the better. This is where CCH to get an analytic information hub is integral to provide unlimited dimensionality and optimized database structure to host and handle massive amounts of data with fast performance. We can leverage built-in data diagnostics to check data, as well as reports to vet it with a human eye. Then it's time for algorithms from our ML library to run and train the machine by back testing against the actuals that we already have. Simulations like AdaBoost, Decision Tree, Duramax, Holt Winters are used here to optimize the mean average percentage of error. But there are many more algorithms within the library, such as Convolutional Neural Network, Light GDM, LSTM Neural Network, and Extreme Gradient Boosting, to name a few that can also be leveraged. Let's go ahead and run the simulation and take a look at the output. On this highly visual accuracy dashboard, we're looking at an aggregated view of product volume across all of our product families and channels for the past five years. The solid line is actual volumes data. And the dotted line is the result of our machine learning simulation. As you can see, the mean average percent of error here's 3.65% across five years, but it's also significantly lower within certain time frame, where you can see a dotted line is actually spot on over the actual. We were able to reduce these percentages of error by bringing in operational as well as external data that proved to be highly correlated to our product volume sold. Over to the right, we're presented with top 15 business drivers that the machine was able to identify, some of which we may not have even thought of much less actually used when we modeled our volumes five years ago. You can see unemployment rate was highly correlated throughout some of the time periods, as well as product marketing campaigns from two periods ago, among others, such as inflation rate and COVID rate from prior period. Now, as we dig in to explain this model, an impact analysis chart actually shows us the variation by month between our actual volumes and the five-year average line broken down by our key business drivers. As we hover over the chart, we can see that product marketing campaigns from two periods ago were prevalent across this time period. And as we reach 2020, unemployment rate drove our volumes down. Additionally, we can dig further into our percentages of error and specific drivers by product family, channel, or region. In addition to the reports we have seen, we can also automate disclosures to management and stakeholders in the form of Word or PowerPoint, as you see here, where the values, text, as well as charts and graphs are all the result of live objects being updated with Intel from our machine learning simulation. The next logical step as depicted in our workflow would be leveraging these insights to incorporate the top drivers we have identified in our automated
automatically augmented revenue planning model and run algorithms to predict the baseline and confidence band for these drivers. What we have here is a net revenue projection model based on predicted volumes and pricing for next year. The first three months are actual data, and that's why we're seeing a solid line. The rest is a forward-looking projection, which starts with a predicted baseline modeled off of estimated driver values, which can also be adjusted below to model our plan volumes. And of course, as we change the plan, the confidence band will be adjusted, which makes all the difference from a purely statistical model. The confidence band appears to be symmetrical in this visual, but will in fact become asymmetrical since drivers themselves may also be correlated. This allows us to create what-if scenarios based on major events that may happen and prepare for a variety of alternative outcomes. So hopefully you found that interesting. Uh, clearly, you know, this model uh, was was run through using, as he mentioned, historical data. So once the model was established and the patterns were very closely aligned, it was very difficult, uh, particularly if you're on a phone, to see that dotted line that he was mentioning in addition to the solid line. They were so close. The machine learning was so close to the actuals. And so then they used that to look backwards at history to confirm that that fit was actually that good. And then using that exact model, then they put that projection into the existing sales forecast to drive the variability that they were looking for. So you can see how uh, doing this modeling, doing the training of the artificial intelligence uh, allows us to then find that best fit algorithm historically to back check that. And then once you're satisfied that that's a nice fit for you, then to apply that to your current uh, business dynamics and, and data that you're looking for to do some sort of a forward projection. So uh, hopefully you found this interesting and helpful. Obviously, if you think through all of the calculations that were represented in that four minutes, that's days, maybe weeks of work for an individual. So this is where that technology can really speed the process for you and allow the machine to do the heavy lifting so that your uh, finance folks that are using this can actually use the data to do more projected, more forward thinking things and spend more time on those insights. So uh, we welcome any inquiry that you might have at Walters Kluwer to talk more about these solutions. Back to you, Hans. Michael, thank you very much. Great presentation. Of course, you, you, you know, taking us through the whole journey and, and of course the video showcasing the tool and what uh, an EPM tool can look like with uh, AI and machine learning. So thank you very much for that. In the essence of time, I'm going to quickly move on to the question to the other panelists. So panelists, if you can join me very quickly. Um, the question from uh, uh, Michael is around, of course, how do you leverage technology or the tool to build trust and skill set of people? Um, so, Christine, if I can come to you, please. Um, yes, what I would say is let people challenge your AI results. Let, let them come up with their own calculation and challenge. Um, so it won't be just a black box or something they don't understand and don't waste your time trying to explain what the computer is doing uh, <laughs> not everybody is built to understand what's going on in that black box yeah brilliant thank you very much um can we go to sebastian please sebastian um yeah if you allow me maybe to answer more for the lenses of uh, let's say data science uh, 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 domain i think what I experienced uh, actually encouraging, of course, the technology uh, uh, allows you to, to to compute, you know, very complicated, massive number of mathematical calculations. It's probably none of the human being would be ever able to do it during your lifetime. So I think this absolutely, in my mind, builds a lot of trust uh, uh, in a way. Uh, but also from a skill set angle, I think uh, maybe also looping a little bit what Christine said it actually gives much more space uh, uh, to, to develop skill set about how do you interpret the data, right? What does it really mean? More like critical thinking. Uh, what did you learn from it and what do you do next? Uh, and, and this is a word which I think goes kind of hand in hand. Uh, yeah, absolutely spot on. So th thank you for that. Michael, any closing comment on this before uh, we move to the exciting Q&A that's coming up? 
Yeah, you know, I think these three topics are a nice blend here. Hopefully you, you got a sense of, you know, how does this affect the organization? What skill set do you need to have? And what's the art of the possible? So hopefully this was helpful. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move on very quickly to the key takeaway session. We've got very limited time, so I'll ask the panelists to give us one quick conclusion or key takeaway that they want to leave the audience with. Sebastian, yours, please. Uh, thank, thank you, Hans. It's, it's, it's quite challenging to, to summarize with one sentence, but if I may, I would say don't be afraid of, of, of really embarking on the journey and uh, trust in science. I, I mean, the math 2 plus 2 gives always 4. That, that might be quite insightful for the business. Absolutely. Spot on there. Christine. Thank you. Um, to sound a bit redundant, I would use uh, Richard Branson words, let go of your fears and fly. So um, be transparent, be vulnerable and just do it. Fantastic. Finally, Michael. I, I would just say, let the technology do the heavy lifting. Focus your people on what's important, which is the insights that come out. Oh, brilliant, brilliant answers there, uh, panelists. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let us move on to the Q&A session uh, now. Uh, just to remind um, the audience, we will answer uh, a few questions today, but please keep sending your question. We will answer all of them via email directly to you, those that we haven't uh, uh, been able to answer. So thank you very much for that. Um, of course, our first question will go to uh, Sebastian. Sebastian. Thank you very much for great presentation. Uh, you shared with us, you know, how to go about doing it as well as some example. I am a bit puzzled because I'm just stuck. I've got, um, I don't really know how to start. What do I start to look at within my organization and start to think, oh, I could do this here, for example. Anything you could help with will be fantastic. Thank you for, for, for a question, and, and I can imagine it's quite a challenging, uh, especially if you are about to think if predictive analytics uh, can offer something to you and, and where to store. Um, well, actually, uh, you know, what I found particularly useful, uh, uh, actually, in, uh, in my journey when I was starting, was really trying to learn, uh, you know, from others. So there are, by now, there are, you know, many companies or organizations that successfully, you know, experiment with it. Uh, that really can offer uh, anybody who thinks about to start or consider starting uh, a very quick ramp up, uh, you, you know, start by just learning from others. You know, there is no need to reinvent the wheel. And I think lessons learned by others can give a very fantastic uh, starting point. A great point there, Sebastian. I, I think you gave six odd examples there yourself. And then Christine went through her model as to where she has used uh, predictive analytics. And I think there was three, four examples there already. And Michael came up with already, uh, you know, all in all, we probably have 10, 12 different examples. So hopefully, you know, from your suggestion, Sebastian, look at what people have already done. That will give you a very good insight as to, hey, maybe I could use this within my organization and start to think that way. So, so very definitely. Thank you very much for that. Um, Christine, uh, a question for you again around trusting your numbers. Uh, I'm afraid people find it quite hard. So my main problem is trusting the numbers. As an accountant, my stakeholders will want to know granular levels of budget forecast numbers. This is going to take some time to persuade non-finance colleague to accept that. How do I get away with this? Um, this is clearly a mindset change, um, definitely. So you definitely need to work with change management, transformation, old and a lot, explain. And what I would say is in parallel, start early to run your AI model, benchmark actual. We start forecasting quarter to quarter and just compare actual forecast AI versus the actual numbers and see discrepancies to start building trust before we build the budget. So from Q1, Q2, Q3 before starting, we've benchmarked AI models with the actuals. And and that gave a lot of ease to people to say, well, all in all, it's not that far. I mean, it's a two percent deviation, so it's not. <laughs> um, so that that's really what we use. So I would say definitely go old ends, and and this is a complete mindset change. So it, I mean, senior management and and change management is key. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And and once you start to build that confidence le level as well, people are easily uh, taken up by and move away from the detailed granular level of bottom up, top down um, sort of uh, uh, implementation as well. Thank you very much for that, Christine. And, and of course, our uh, next question comes to uh, Michael. Michael, fantastic tool and, and, and fantastic show there. Mm -hmm. Um, how we've already got an EPM tool that doesn't have any of those capability. How easy is it to, um, you know, add on, et cetera? How, how does that work? Yeah, you know, the models really can stand on their own. Uh, they don't have to be integrated within that tool. And while you will be using some of the data that comes maybe from your EPM in addition to your ERP to back check the, uh, the model that you select, um, it, it is possible to use this in isolation in a standalone mode and kind of operate these models and this technology uh, to the side of your primary system uh, and then to use the results obviously to help with the modeling uh, which may need to be done offline and then uploaded for example back into the EPM. Fantastic, thank you very much for that. Very important to shout out, yes some tools already have it uh, built within but uh, as you mentioned you know they could very easily be used as an uh, add-on as well. So panel, panelists, thank you very much for um, the answers. Unfortunately, we don't have much more time to go through more, but rest assured, all the questions you've sent will be answered, so you could keep sending till the end of the session. Anyway, panelists, keep uh, uh, the webcam on. We've only got a few uh, uh, last-minute slides. Uh, one here, which is around what is next, so winning formula for FPNA storytelling. Very important, we looked at storytelling aspects earlier on as well. So that's on April the 4th. And uh, uh, also key FPNA challenges and how to address them on May the 4th. So something for your diary there. Of course, FPNA survey trends, which I shared earlier on, was up to 2022. We've got the new one coming up. So please, as you've always done, help us give us more insight into your organization. 10 to 12 minutes. It's all that it takes. Um, coming to the end, I would like to say a big massive thank you to the Fluers for uh, their sponsorship and making this possible. A big massive thank you to our panelists for all the fantastic insight, their hard work and time. And then finally, a big thank you to our audience for uh, participating today. Hope that has been uh, very fruitful to you. And this is how you can keep in touch with us. Um, I'm afraid uh, it's time to go now, uh, but just before I close it, a quick reminder that we've got uh, the feedback form after this, so please give us a couple of minutes. So, ladies and gentlemen, with that, I say thank you very much. Have a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and hope to see you soon on the next webinar. Thank you very much. Goodbye, all. Goodbye. <laughs>